we want uh, would like to have questions from you so you can write in the chat box and uh, I will address the questions to our speakers because uh, we do have a short Q and A session after each uh, presentation. So please um, share your thoughts, share your uh, ideas because we do want to have a, a co-creative atmosphere. Before I give the floor to the first speaker, I want to introduce you briefly about the project on uh, which uh, we are organizing this webinar. This is the fifth webinar organized within uh, the project Climate Innovation and uh, Circular Economy Beacons. We have uh, started together with uh, Climate Kick and uh, with six members of consortia coming from Serbia, Bulgaria, Greece, uh, Spain, Germany, and Romania. But are, what are we aiming for? is to enable systemic uh, implementation and innovation in regards to circular economy to our region, because uh, there are specific requirements and needs for uh, our Balkan region, both economically and uh, politically to adopt the circular economy. For this year, our goal is to bridge the knowledge gap between Western partners and uh, our local exports, and uh, to create a common uh, circular implementation framework with which uh, we will be able to approach our stakeholders. In the future, we plan to encompass uh, all the uh, Balkan countries and also to activate and collaborate with all the uh, local actors that can uh, contribute to circular economy. This is a very short uh, introduction from my side and uh, I would uh, like uh, to add only one more thing and uh, that is to announce our project conference that will uh, be held next month under the topic of a circular economy in balkan region now i uh, would like to introduce the first uh, topic uh, for today out of three the first topic will be regarding material flows industrial ecology and the science of uh, material flows and uh, I will invite Andrei Kulikan, who is a sustainable development expert and the managing director of Susfera Management from Romania. Uh, Andrei, I kindly ask you to share your screen and um, you will have 20 minutes for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana, and uh, welcome everybody. Um, before uh, before uh, sharing my screen, I'm just uh, I will just uh, present myself very very quickly. I'm working in this field of sustainable development for about ten years. Uh, I have a background, an educational background of uh, engineering. So uh, the topic of today, industrial ecology, fits my my profile in a way that uh, I'm concerned about. Uh, um, the sustainability of our uh, economy, but I'm also concerned how we can translate these sustainability principles in our day-to-day uh, -day economic and uh, industrial activities. So I kindly ask you to see my presentation from these two perspectives. So from the perspective of, of uh, ecology, uh, meaning uh, the study of natural systems, and from the perspective of industry. industry meaning the study of industrial systems. So this is what I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to, to, to try to, to introduce to you this topic of industrial um, um, ecology. We'll try to, to make um, a comprehensive table, let's say, or, or, or a picture uh, about this topic, what it does, uh, what are the, the, the subjects of interest, what are its methods, but also uh, I want to, to discuss about this topic uh, with you from, from other angles, let's put it like this. We, we need to understand also the context in which we discuss about in this industrial ecology. We need also to understand the challenges that we face and um, we also have to have some examples and data and figures in order to to have a, a clear picture on, of, of 
what we are talking about. We, I'm not going to enter into very technical details. I'm going to present the topic from a, from a larger perspective. So um, let's, let's start with um, the presentation. And I will I will switch off my camera in order for you to concentrate on the on the presentation and then on uh, my voice also. So um, we we. We discussed about about what we how we should start uh, the the webinar today, and we decided that we should start with a um, with a let's say a general overview about um, about uh, the two topics that we will address: ecology and and uh, industrial um, uh, ecology. Because these two topics, as you as you can see, they are not. Uh, separated. We have to understand the, the industrial ecology topic in context. Well, we have to understand that we discuss about this in the context of circular economy. Probably you all know the very fam famous uh, butterfly diagram of circular economy, in which we can clearly show or and we can clearly see the two worlds that, that we want to connect, the natural world, which is the biosphere, and the techni technical world, which is the technosphere. Industrial ecology focuses on understanding how industrial system works and how uh, technical materials flow through various industrial and economy system. And the ecology, uh, it's focused on understanding how natural system works and how natural uh, flows go uh, through this, all these cycles. They are the two sides of one image. So we, we need to see them as a whole because industrial ecology is based on ecology. Uh, uh, it's, it's a, let's say, a relatively new branch of science which appears, appeared in, in, in the 60s, uh, but it uses the same approaches and the same methods as ecology. So what I'm proposing you is that in order to understand industrial ecology, let's look first on ecology, what it is, what it does, what it produced, and, and what we learned until now, uh, applying the ecological uh, methods and way of thinking. So if we want to summarize ecology in, in a phrase, I would say that ecology is uh, uh, referring to observing the, the living things, living their lives, not as separate things, but as, as a living whole, in order to understand life processes or the movement of materials and energy through uh, ecosystem communities. So ecology means, or, or its topics of interest refers to, to, to aspects like biodiversity, distribution, biomass, and population of organisms. It, it, it is studying these this topics uh, within ecosystems, so within a framework in which everything is connected, in which everything flows through, from, through systems from state to state. So ecology, it's, it's, it's like looking on the whole picture of nature and how it works and how the material and energy flows through it and how life works and develops and, and to understand its principles and its laws uh, better so we can adapt to it. So this is, this is in general speaking, uh, uh, ecology. Thanks to, to ecology, we, we learned that uh, Earth is functioning in systems or in cycles. Uh, and these, these cycles are the key life-sustaining processes in nature. Uh, there are many natural cycles, but, but the key ones are referring to water cycle, carbon cycle, and nitrogen cycles. The fact that, that they are cycles means that there is a constant and ongoing exchange of elements between air, earth, water, plants, and animals. And throughout these cycles, um, 
earth continuously uh, renews itself. So this is the first picture what of, of earth uh, that ecology produced to us. And, and these things were in the, uh, uh, in the beginning or in our history were understood but a, at a very general level. Now, based on the studies that, that we, we have uh, undertaken in the last 50 years, now we can really understand how nature works, what are the cycles, what are the processes that are going on there, and how, how uh, uh, lives continue to, to exist and thrive on, on the planet. So this is the first key image or the first key insight that ecology uh, produced for, for us. Um, but in order to, to understand better uh, the results and the application of ecology, let's take an example and look at the carbon cycle on our planet. I, I choose the carbon cycle from obvious reasons because uh, uh, we are talking about climate change on a daily basis. And we all know that climate change is produced or it's it's an effect of um, uh, unbalance of the carbon cycle. And I will try to, to explain this as, as uh, uh, um, let's say, um, clearly and simple as, uh, as I can. So we, we know that there is a carbon cycle uh, uh, in, in, uh, which is going on, on at the level of our planet. Uh, and we know also that about 80% of our body consists of carbon atoms by mass and those carb carbon atoms are, are pretty key to our existence. Without carbon, uh, we wouldn't have the plasma membranes of our cells, the sugar molecule molecules that you use for fuel and even our DNA. So carbon is a very, very important material in, in nature. Uh, most of the Earth's carbon is about uh, 60,000 uh, billion metric, metric tons, it's stored, in, it's stored in rocks. The rest is in the ocean, atmosphere, plants, soils, and, and fossil fuels. What you see on the screen, it's a diagram which presents the fast carbon cycle, and I will discuss about the fast carbon cycle and the slow carbon cycle. But first, let's take a look at the fast carbon cycle, which uh, uh, which is, shows the movement of carbon between land, atmosphere, and oceans. Uh, yellow numbers are natural fluxes, and red are the human contribution in gigatons per year. Um, the white numbers indicate stored carbon. So what you see, it's an early uh, representation of the, the carbon, uh, how the carbon goes and flows through the um, uh, ecosystems of, of our planet. And you can also see clearly the human contributions. Uh, on the long term, the carbon cycle seems to maintain a, a balance that prevents all of Earth's carbon from entering the atmosphere or from being stored entirely in rocks. This balance helps uh, the Earth's temperature to, to remain stable. So the balance of the carbon cycle influences the stability of our temperature in the atmosphere. This is one of the key insights that ecology provided to us. Discussing about the rapid carbon exchange and the long, long uh, carbon cycling. Now, just to, to give you uh, this overview about how material cycles through, through uh, uh, ecosystems, you probably know that most of the carbon exchange in nature, it's, it's produced uh, uh, based on the process of photosynthesis, photosynthesis which, is, which is a process specific to plants, bacteria, and, and um, 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 let's say ocean uh, feet, of, feet of plankton. So this is the, the most important process which, which uh, runs in nature and, and which provides the energy for all life to exist. And this, this process basically transforms uh, carbon from the atmosphere in, in other nutrients or other kind of energy which is used by, by plants and, and plantains. This is the fast uh, carbon cycle. The, the long-term carbon cycle refers to the storage of organic carbon uh, in matter. Uh, when 
um, living organisms die. For example, um, uh, when plants and animals die and, and uh, their remains sink into the foils, into the soil, producing the, um, uh, the fossil fuels that we are uh, using. So this is another insight from ecology. We understood the carbon cycle in general. We, we saw also that there are two, two cycles within the same cycle. And I will try to, to, to show you these two cycles. And I'm asking you to, to study a bit the, the, the slide. What you see on the slide is a deeper look on the carbon cycle. It's a look from three perspectives. The short-term pattern of the carbon uh, which is the, uh, an annual pattern, the medium term pattern, which is on, on the time scale of decades, and the very long uh, pattern, which is at the time scale of hundreds, of hundreds of thousands of years. So please, let's try to have a quick discussion or dialogue in, in the context or in the boundaries of an uh, online session. But let's try to study a little bit the, the, the slide. And then write on the, on the um, uh, chat of our um, uh, online tool, please write, what do you think is the cause of the annual evolution like ups and downs in the short-term pattern of carbons? Of carbon. So what do you think that variation and ups and downs, uh, what, what, what do you think that they are the causes of the variations of the carbon cycle from year to year? Basically what you see with the red um, uh, color in the left diagram. So just take 20-30 seconds, think on this issue and, and put it on the chat of our uh, session. Okay, I will, I will move forward to show you a different look or a different perspective on the carbon uh, cycle or the annual carbon flow. This time it's a perspective um, or we look at the carbon flow from a budgeting perspective. What you see basically is, is a, a, a diagram presenting you the annual carbon flow um, on the path cycle. So you probably noticed already the red um, figures and the red uh, uh, texts. And this, these figures represent the amount of carbon uh, in gigatons that we put annually into the atmosphere. So this, these red figures are the, the quantities of carbon, of carbon which should not be there. Because we discussed about the regularity of the carbon cycle. Now, after 300 years of, of industrial revolution, we managed to, to um, uh, influence uh, this carbon cycle. And we are adding about nine gigatons of carbon every year into the atmosphere. Um, this, this is due to our, to our industrial process. This is due to, to us moving the carbon from its uh, uh, sinks, moving the carbon from, from uh, the fossil fuels uh, into the atmosphere. And this, this is not a natural process. This, this is not, uh, uh, let's say, embedded already in the natural cycles of the earth. This is a uh, uh, the regulation of the, the carbon budget at the, at the uh, level of the earth. So 
these are the things that ecology produce for us, this kind of, of data, this, this kind of understandings, this kind of images that show us how natural world works, but also show us how we influence the natural uh, uh, world. Now, applying the same principle to the econ to economy or in this industry, uh, what you see here are the material economical flows or the economic material flows which goes through our economic system. And what you see, it's a picture uh, um, uh, which presents you a situation at the level of year 2017, but also makes some projections for about uh, uh, until about 200, uh, 2050. What we can see is that in, in the last uh, four decades, we, we tripled our material consumption. So basically we tripled the quantity of materials that we take from the natural systems and we use and then we dispose. What you see, this kind of graph, it's an expression of our economical linear system. And using the same principles or the same linear thinking, this graph uh, or, or this, this pattern will continue uh, to grow uh, until Earth systems will be unbalanced. And, and we, we know what, what that means. We know that we can suffer uh, from climate change and all kinds of other uh, uh, unbalances uh, on, on Earth. So this is like an introduction of industrial ecology because industrial ecology looks on, on not on on, on natural cycles, but on economical cycles. And this is the big perspective when we look on, on economical cycles. Um, now that we have, a, a, let's say, a general understanding of ecology, let's move to, to industrial ecology and see that industrial ecology is merely like a little sister of ecology. It uses the same principles and approach in order to understand how materials and energy flow through industrial systems and what are the effects of these flows on environment, economic and social systems. Um, industrial ecology is ecological in, in at least two senses. First, uh, it looks to non-human like, like natural systems as models for industry, industrial activity. Uh, and this is expressed in the topic which you probably know uh, 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 or you heard about industrial metabolism. So it looks on, on, on systems, on how, how materials flow through, through this kind of, of industrial systems. But also it's ecological because uh, places the human technology, meaning the industry, in the context of the larger ecosystems. So in the larger, in, in the context of nature and, and tries to find answers to how we can fit in, in the natural flows of materials. And from this perspective, the, the well-known branch of industrial ecology, ecology refers to industrial ecoparks, which is a, a, a try of humans to, to construct some industrial clusters uh, based on the models of ecosystem in which materials goes from company to companies. Uh, probably you also you, you, you know or you heard about different industrial ecology tools. Uh, and these tools refer to, to material flow analysis or life cycle analysis or eco-efficiency or environmental accounting. These are tools used in the industrial ecology. What it produced, like, like ecology, it produced different kinds of understandings, data and, and ideas about how how the, the material flows through our economic systems. And, and you can see on the screen um, two, two aspects of, of material flows at the level of EU and at the global level. So basically what you, you can see very clearly that, that our uh, economical system uh, cycles back less than 10% of the materials that it uses and this is globally, but also you can see this aspect on the uh, 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 EU level that with the, the um, uh, green line, you see all the, the recycling flows of materials and, and how little they are from the total flows of the materials. So this is industrial ecology. It, it looks at things from this kind of perspectives and tries to map the flows 
and tries to understand how, how this flows goes through different systems. Now, why, why, why do you, why, or why should we discuss about industrial ecology or what is the purpose of industrial ecology? Why is it needed in the context of circular economy? Um, well, th there is a very important difference uh, or yes, yeah, difference I can say between linear economy and circular economy. The main difference is that we try to, to move those 95 gigatons of resources that we consume each year into a circular system and not to waste them. So this is a very, very colossal and, and challenging uh, task. So we, we need or we try to, to recirculate the materials uh, as nature does. And in order to do this, we need to move away from eco-efficiency and to go forward to eco-effectiveness. So we need, we need to, to start thinking on how we can reuse indefinitely our uh, materials, technological materials, and prevent them entering the natural flows of materials. And this cannot be done with eco-efficiency. Eco-efficiency, it's uh, focused on reducing the consumption and not on how to cycle back different kind of materials on, or how to find different solutions of reintegrating the value of materials back into the economical system. And that's why we need industrial ecology. We need to use it to understand how materials are flowing through our industry and to find ways to optimize this, this, uh, this flow. One of the uh, very good and relevant example of industrial ecology comes from, um, from uh, the topic or from the area of industrial symbiosis. Industrial symbiosis refers or it's applied uh, within or at the level of eco parks. And uh, it refers or it, it touches the, the questions on how companies can function as an ecosystem. How can they change different kinds of materials and, and how can they work together in keeping the material flow between their, them? And what you see here is the best well-known example of Kalundborg Industrial Park, which um, uh, is made up of, of uh, a partnership between 11 public and private companies. And um, the main principle in, in, in Kalundborg, which is a region, I don't know if I mentioned it, Kalundborg is a district in Denmark. Uh, the main principle is that the residue from uh, one company becomes the resources that another. Um, Kalundborg symbiosis is made up of 25 different streams, including water, energy, and material flow. And you can see them circulating into the, in, in the system uh, on, on the screen. Um, the resources flows from or emanate from six industrial and three public sector organizations. The partnership was formalized in 2011. And one key element of this partnership or one key element of this uh, symbiosis is the exchange of high temperature stream from the combined heat and power plant uh, of Kalungborg. So this power plant produces uh, high temperature steam, which is used in different ways by the, the other companies. Uh, this symbiotic project changed uh, the, the power plant business model. This power plant switched from producing electricity with the excess steam to producing steam as a primary product. So this is one example of how industrial ecology works in practice, how we can connect different kinds of flows and what are the main flows and how we can use this, these flows in order to, to facilitate um, uh, exchange between different partners in, in an industrial uh, system and exchange and keep the, the materials inside uh, a system. As, as a conclusion or as a final uh, point to my presentation, I want to, to touch the paradigm of industrial ecology. What are the 
the the key principles or the the fundamental ideas that uh, um, uh, are behind the concept of the industrial ecology, uh, and these these are very different from from what we are used to in our linear economy. So these fundamental fundamental ideas uh, refer to the recognition recognition of the fact that industrial economies are, are embedded within the global ecosphere and we we need to develop solutions for integrating them into a natural world enabled to 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 uh, in order to enable their sustainable coexistence so basically what it says is that we need to reconsider how we do economy in our planet we need to see that we are we are part of of the the natural systems and the natural uh, cycles of of the earth and we need to integrate we need to to be a part of them as as both as users but also as producers of materials which are not polluting the environment so we need to fit in uh, let's let's put it like this and for this uh, um, we need to see this relation we need to look not just on 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 uh, how we produce more or how we consume more or how we grow our economy but we have to look on how we link it to natural world without polluting the natural world and how we can use what we learn from nature and apply in our industrial uh, ecology uh, in industrial systems in order to decrease our environmental impact so in short this is industrial ecology. This is what it does. This is what it believes in, and and it fits perfectly with the with the challenges and uh, the objectives of circular economy. Um, I will not end the the presentation without going through two questions for you. So I will I will launch a poll of two questions, and please allocate for each of, of them one minute and try to, to um, respond as, let's say, uh, clearly or as sincere as you can, because we are using these polls not just to collect some data, but we to, to understand your opinions, your views, uh, to understand where we are in terms of, of knowledge and understanding of these topics and we will try to, to uh, embed this information in our project in order to create or to come up with topics and knowledge relevant to, to your need. So let's, let's go through, through the first poll and please don't see it as a test. It's not a test. There are not questions. These questions are not mean to, to test what you uh, remember from the presentation or, or, or what you uh, uh, know, but we, we just want to, to see your um, uh, opinions and your ideas about the topics that we discussed. The first, the first poll, um, it, it refers to the most relevant human actions which affects the carbon cycle. Uh, it seems we didn't have enough time, but I think the, the responses are very relevant. And uh, as most of you uh, sensed, the extraction and burning of fossil fo uh, fossils are the most relevant human actions which affects the carbon cycle. Uh, let's go to the second poll.
So these are the results of the, the second question. And uh, we can see that most of us are familiar with life cycle analysis. And I hope that now you, you know where this life cycle analysis method comes from and then what are the principles and what is behind and what is the concepts, the, the let's say the underlining uh, concepts of, of what of or why we are doing life cycle analysis. Okay, well, this is from uh, uh, my part. I don't know if we have some time for some questions. I will be uh, uh, gladly respond, but I think Adriana will propose to have these questions at the end. I don't know, or we can take them right now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre, for making more clear what it is uh, the purpose and uh, which are the key principles of uh, industrial ecology and uh, why it is needed for implementing circular economy. But uh, maybe it will be interesting to find out if uh, circular economy does uh, propose a different approach to sustainability. Uh, yes, actually, actually, industrial ecology uh, in combination with circular economy propose a different approach to sustainability, which, which I think I mentioned in, in briefly. Let me try to go back. I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know if you see something or not. Uh, no, right now we do not see. You can uh, stop sharing and uh, try again to share your presentation. Yes, I, mm, I did this. No, I cannot share. I don't know what's happened, but okay, I will, I will, I will. Uh, let's discuss it uh, freely. So yes, it proposes a different approach to sustainability, meaning that we need to see sustainability not uh, as a continuous improvement of our uh, uh, efficiency, not as continuous improvement of our, let's say, or uh, material consumption, but we see we and we need to see sustain sustainability as an integration into the natural world and into the natural cycles. And in order to do this, we need to understand them and we need to understand how we link our industrial cycles with the natural cycles. So this is the, the perspective. And I think it's a more clear perspective than the, the general perspective of sustainability that, that we had until now. Uh, thank you, Andre. There is another question and uh, it is related to what uh, nature is teaching us. If uh, you would pick one principle uh, learned from nature that uh, we should consider and apply in our industrial process, what uh, would that be? Oh, oh, um, we already apply different principles in uh, natural principles in our industrial processes, but I think that we what we do not apply fully or we, we are not concerned with, it's how we can use materials in such a way that at the end of their life cycle or lifetime, they do not become waste or they do not produce pollution or they are not pollutants. And, and nature show us that every material which cycles through, through its processes has some use and it's used in a way or another and it's not it's not uh, affecting uh, other ecosystems ability to to function so nature basically transforms every, everything and i think that we need to to learn to transform everything and to give everything a value and to use every material as long as we can so this is i think that we can learn from nature thank you very much andre uh, I do encourage you to share your um, ideas and uh, your thoughts in the chat box. Uh, please uh, do not be uh, uh, discouraged and uh, do so. And I did place uh, the live streaming link uh, in the chat box so you can share it with your peers in, if you do find uh, this uh, event uh, useful. Now, 
I will invite the second speaker, Ms. Cristina Borca from Aqua Team, the largest water utility company in Western Romania. She's a chemist and has a PhD in management and engineering from Politecnica University of Timisoara. And uh, she will be presenting us some best practices and um, uh, related to the water sector and uh, the relation with the circular economy. Christina, please, uh, yes, you already shared your screen. Uh, you do have 20 minutes for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana, for the um, introduction and for, present, for my presentation. And um, uh, I'm glad that um, I'm glad to see that Adriana and I have uh, synchronized in the terms of uh, description of natural cycles in parallel with uh, industrial cycles, because uh, this is I am going to do in um, in water sector. So, as Adriana said, I am uh, I'm working at the uh, Aqua Team uh, Water Operator in uh, Mif County. I will present some facts and figures, figures about um, Aqua Team. Um, we are the largest operator in the west uh, part of uh, our, uh, situated in the west part of our uh, country. We operating uh, through 28 water treatment plants and with the 24 wastewater treatment plants. Also, uh, um, our uh, clients are, um, of course, uh, peoples and uh, industry. We have more than uh, 500,000 inhabitants out of which uh, almost um, 100 has access to Aquatim water supply services. And more than 70% has access to Aquatim's uh, waste water collection uh, services. And another details in um, Timisoara, the, the daily consumption is um, around uh, 110 liter per uh, each um, person. So what I will present you today is um, a parallel between uh, natural water cycle and uh, human-made water cycles or social water cycles. I will talk about environmental flow about uh, the opportunity uh, related to um, a circular economy. And I will give you some examples of um, circular economy initiatives in, um, in water sector. Of course, conclusions in the end. And I will give you a short biography. And uh, I can say not a biography, but uh, it can be see like um, a valuable, a valuable um, source of uh, information. So um, we all know that uh, what is natural water cycle is of course a continuing process of evaporation, condensation, precipitation, and the groundwater influence as water moves naturally from oceans and rivers to the atmosphere and land. Of course, this is a driving force for the formation of water resources, and it is vital for environmental. This natural cycle still occurs in towns and cities, but is impacted by people and uh, development and their development. And furthermore, uh, the natural water cycle is uh, indirectly influenced by the global uh, climate changes as a result of the excessive expansion of uh, human activities, making the water management more and more challenging. What is social or human made uh, water cycle? Of course, is created uh, to provide drinking water and to remove wastewater and uh, to redirect uh, storm water away from our uh, homes and uh, businesses into our waterways. The social water cycles is mainly related to industrial and urban water use supply change, which consists of, as I said, in water supply, water use or consumption, drainage treatment, and sometimes reuse. And um, this water cycle, social water cycle, interferes with the natural water pathway by multiple uh, abstraction, abstraction and discharges of water by the industrial and urban water cycles, affect the uh, uh, water quantity 
and quality of uh, water bodies. According to a uh, statistic, over at the global level, over than 80% of wastewater generated by society flows back into the environment without being treated or reused. This has serious implication for ecosystems health and will have a, cost, a costly impact on um, society in the future. What about environmental, environmental flows or flow? In, um, order to maintain the environmental health in good condition with uh, uh, all consumed water uh, should not uh, exceed the minimum environmental flow, which is vital for ecosystem. However, in some regions, the natural replenishment rates are too low, which leads to water stress. As you can see in, um, the next figure, it is estimated based on uh, statistical interpretation um, where the Research Institute give, it, give us some, um, some images about, uh, about the water stress in the future. Mm -hmm. As, you, as uh, you, you can see, um, a lot of areas will be water stress in, uh, in the future. Why? Because, um, uh, because as I said, um, environmental flow uh, in uh, that countries will be too low. Uh, those, um, the adoption of circular economy approach for improving the sustainability of the industry and urban water cycles are of significant importance to maintain the balance between the natural and man-made water um, cycles. Um, we have um, a source of a uh, very valuable source of the information. Um, Ellen MacArthur Foundation give us some um, some uh, uh, tools for uh, management, uh, like uh, a diagram represent a nature managed system that. Um, give us some idea about how nature manage water uh, system. Within a given uh, basin, the natural uh, water cycles act to re-optimize, reuse, and replenish water. Those three terms, re-optimize, reuse, and replenish, we will call it uh, the um, three Rs. What it means, uh, re-optimize means that um, ecosystem um, are naturally uh, adapted and uh, in continuous um, evolution, uh, what is mean um, the ability to adapt by plants and animals to a changing environment. Reuse means that um, uh, water is uh, treated uh, naturally and um, it moves from fire to lower elevation and interacts with flora and fauna. And replenish um, the natural uh, cycle concludes with the return of water to the environment through evapotranspiration, infiltration, and uh, surface water uh, flows. Same um, resource, Ellen MacArthur Foundation, gives us uh, um, an image about uh, human managed water use and it uh, in present it's about uh, um, a linear approach of human managed water use which is in um, majority of uh, basins um, today and um, which is uh, very unsustainable and uh, this uh, linear approach take use discharge also goes against all three uh, circular economy principles. That's why um, now uh, we can see an opportunity uh, in order to, to establish uh, the environmental flow. We can add another two uh, R, let's say like that, to the, um, recover, uh, reduce, um, 
um, reuse, recycle, and uh, restore. In terms of uh, circular water management, uh, reduce means to uh, water, reduce water losses by boosting water efficiency. Reuse means to um, uh, reuse water uh, in the point of, uh, in some points of uh, treatment for, for uh, different uh, processes. Recycle means to recycle uh, resources and wastewater. Restore means to uh, return water to source at the same or better quality and recover um, from um, recover resources from wastewater and put them um, to use. In the end, uh, a parallel between um, natural and uh, human managed um, water circular, uh, it is shown in that figures. So um, uh, put water use in these loops can have multiple di dimensions and uh, understanding um, this, I mean, uh, the, this opportunity to reuse or to recycle uh, water is fundamental to realizing the opportunity and the enterprise, the potential of water and the circular um, economy. You can see that uh, water utilities, uh, it is placed in the middle of, uh, of entire um, uh, cycles of water cycles and uh, becomes uh, engines for uh, the circular economy. Also, um, uh, water utilities have the opportunity to start to see water as a medium of available resources and more significantly have an important role to play as a resource steward. Uh, water utilities have managed Uh, three, uh, loading through demand uh, management, uh, resource di diversification, operational optimization, and uh, nutrient uh, recovery. So uh, we have uh, noticed that uh, uh, transitioning to, to water circular, uh, there is a, uh, two significant drawbacks, an impending uh, regulatory environment and uh, an uh, opaque uh, market uh, conditions. This is two disadvantages that will um, uh, can um, uh, um, stop or uh, will um, be like a barrier in implementing the uh, water circular uh, actions in uh, um, in the water sector. So. Um, there are a lot of uh, opportunities or a lot of initiatives in um, related to municipal water system, especially uh, related to wastewater treatment plant. Uh, there are um, links and uh, interfaces with uh, other systems, with uh, energy, with um, agriculture, with uh, a lot of uh, industries. Also, uh, mapping these systems in more details will help us will help us um, uh, to uh, st establish opportunity and uh, value creation. I uh, will give you an example: uh, Aqua Team's uh, circular initiatives. Um, the water um, operator uh, now is it involved into uh, this kind of a project. It is called the next gen. What uh, Aqua Team will do in uh, within this project will um, will will establish a business model for um, sludge management, and um, it will um, develop a pilot scale testing for thermochemical conversion. And uh, within this project, we'll uh, find um, 
a sludge management to produce uh, to produce um, uh, energy. For example, uh, in uh, Timisoara, we have um, now uh, some uh, project in uh, uh, a large in, in a large investment. And we will try to establish the best way to, to manage the sludge uh, within the wastewater treatment plant. Also feasibility study of uh, water re reuse will be um, salt, it will be uh, delivered in um, next gen uh, project. More, um, more initiative, not only from Romania, but uh, an entire world, uh, you can find on the Academica Foundation, the recent uh, was an um, event, um, Aqua Circular Converse, uh, Aqua Circular Conference. And in, within this conference, uh, the organizers try to bring together all this kind of uh, initiative and uh, present it uh, in details. So I will... Um, now I will uh, try to, to conduct some polls, but uh, I think I, I first I will stop my presentation because it seems to know works like that. And in conclusions, um, we all know that um, water demand is expected to, to increase um, till um, many years from now. And uh, uh, there are uh, new water management strategies needed in line with uh, this demand. Uh, by pursuing the five R's approach, reducing reuse and recycle water while recovering resources and replenish water ecosystems, companies can create benefits for their own operation for other water users or for um, the ecosystems in which they operate and uh, depend. Also, close sectoral collaboration between industry, agriculture, and government, as uh, well the recovery of resources such as energy, nutrients, and metal from wastewater are important aspect of the circular economy approach. However, uh, in the end, I would like to highlight the potential for water reuse and the wastewater recycle in, uh, in the process of um, circular uh, economy. Now I would like to, to start the polls because uh, I uh, want to know your opinion regarding the barriers and the key success factor. Which one do you consider to be the most significant barrier in the way of reusing, uh, reducing and recycle water. Now I I think I now I can end polling if you are um, if you allow me because I guess nobody voted um, now so I'm glad to see that um, lack of awareness is uh, on the top of your uh, opinion okay. Um, from my point of view as a communicator, this can be a very important uh, start in uh, order to establish uh, my, uh, my Aqua Team's uh, um, communications uh, plan. So this lack of awareness, in your opinion, it, 
it is uh, is uh, the most significant barrier in the way of um, reusing and um, recycling water so we can uh, we can um, try to um, open another poll so what do you think uh, what do you consider to be the most significant key to key factor to reduce reuse and uh, recycle water Okay, thank you for your uh, answer. I, I will share the results. So uh, changing uh, mindset on the value of uh, wastewater. Okay, this will be important uh, input, as I said, for um, communication in a water circular uh, economy in the future. So um, I uh, now end my presentation. I would like to thank you for your uh, patience and for your attentions, for your attention. And uh, now if there is any question, I am here to answer you. Thank you very much, Christina, for this comprehensive parallel between uh, natural and human made water cycle and uh, the opportunities that are there for circular economy and the measures to align the human water cycle with the natural one. And uh, could you give us more details on uh, suppliers' needs? Do suppliers have enough water to operate and grow? Okay, uh, thank you for these questions, for this question. Uh, as I uh, as I uh, show you in um, in uh, the first uh, slides, uh, there will be um, water stress in the future, but uh, there is an opportunity for growth, as I said, for uh, water um, utilities by becoming less dependent on a particular water supply. A business uh, have more opportunities for grow, and. Um, this is the key for uh, growth and the continuity of uh, industrial operation. Uh, also growth may generate more revenue and provide the opportunities to further uh, advance water um, management. Uh, using um, um, circular economy um, strategies like, let's say like that, maybe uh, reducing water use, we save in the future uh, energy and chemicals, and uh, also we can uh, reduce effluent discharge uh, fees. So uh, I think uh, in the future, um, water utilities must reinvent it in order to face that uh, water scarcity. Uh, so this is my opinion. We have to, there is a challenge for uh, today for um, water utilities and they have to face it, but they have to, to um, be more involved in, uh, in, um, in water circular um, sector. Thank you, Christina. I do have uh, only one more question. Can you give us uh, some more examples on uh, circular economy projects in the Romanian water sector? Um, another, another. Um, can I uh, can I give you more? I can give you more details. Uh, I will try to access um, a link. As I uh, told you, it, uh, well, it is about. Um, Aqua circular 
conference that uh, brings together um, uh, brings together um, a lot of um, initiatives in um, circular uh, water. So um, in Romania, there are a few few initiatives, very very little, as, as I said. Uh, we are um, talking about uh, volatile and we are talking about the next gen projects, only two. There are uh, uh, more uh, politically, let's say, uh, uh, a lot of strategies of uh, developing um, the circular economy at the national level, but um, um, Two little projects, not as many as we, um, not as many as we expected or uh, as it must be. We have next gen, as I said, and also we have bioradio and uh, volatile project at the level at the uh, Romanian um, water sector. But I will uh, uh, invite you to, to visit Academica Foundation. And uh, here you can uh, download uh, uh, all presentation within the conference. And also um, you can uh, find um, business opportunities, of course, why not, in um, regional um, uh market of uh, water and uh, circular uh, economy thank you again christina it was a very very interesting uh, presentation from your side if uh, we do not uh, have uh, other questions from the audience in the chat box uh, i will uh, invite uh, milan vaselino our last speaker from siricon He's um, our Serbian circular economy guru, and uh, he is the driving force of this project. Milan, the floor is yours. Thank you. I need to prove this guru thing. I don't know how to prove this one. I guess everyone should meditate now with me like for the next 20 minutes. <laughs> thanks, can, thanks very much. <laughs> I can always call you godfather if you would prefer. <laughs> ah, grandfather, grandfather. No, godfather is a little bit different. <laughs> I know, I know. Grand, grandfather uh, trader. Uh, hey, hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be once again in this setup. Uh, uh, a little bit of mixed audience and uh, very interested people, I would say. I would really like to add these, some of the questions from your side and to finalize the webinar of the, of the uh, notion of let's continue being in touch. Uh, so you can write to me, you can write to Adriana, you can also visit our websites and write questions there. But we really want to um, support and catalyze circular economy implementation and circular economy innovation. In regards to this, uh, excuse me, my today's uh, presentation will be about how to close the loop and what are the positive, uh, positive experiences from the practice here and abroad around uh, creating a value from waste. So hopefully you can see my screen now. Right. Yes, I will we put can my see. timer on. I'll put my timer on because usually I can just talk and talk and talk, which is not really good. And okay, I'll start. Right. So just uh, a glimpse of uh, information. Who do you talk to? Uh, I've been uh, dealing with the circular economy professionally for the last four or five years. Uh, finished the master studies on industrial ecology that is very much connected to the whole systemic circular economy. I would say that only the name was industrial ecology, but uh, everything else was around the uh, circular economy. Um, and since then dedicated my career to this. Uh, being my, a little bit crazy and coming back to Serbia, um, when this topic was completely uh, people were completely unaware about what circular economy is. And until then, uh, from that moment until now, managed to create a couple of brands, design academy for circular economy. That's something that Serbian participants had 
most probably heard of or maybe heard of. Um, so this program is regarding is aimed to educate people around circular economy systemically in Serbia, and we are now looking for the options how to scale this to Europe because this is this format got very much recognized in the systemic approach towards towards the topic. And one of uh, the, and the second biggest thing that we are trying to create this year, next year, and the year that is after this is Circle Economy Beacons. Uh, and that is the program these webinars are part of. So in this program, we want to lower the barriers of uh, circular economy implementation in the Balkans region through expertise, uh, to, through shared vision and uh, expertise, knowledge and information. So we want to collaborate between the countries. Currently, we encompass Serbia, Bulgaria, Romania, Greece, Germany and Spain. And from the next year, we will definitely include one more country from the West Balkans and one more country from the, from the Western part of European Union that are more advanced in circular economy. So a lot of uh, knowledge exchange and experience change is happening here. So if, if, any, if to any word, this is the doors you should knock if you have any kind of questions in regards to um, specializing or, or experts opinion on circular economy. Right, so let's jump to the, to the real stuff. Do we need to change? This is the main question of uh, closing the loop. Would you like to live with person that 92% of its time spends at home? At 60% of your house, he or she had never entered, so basically just laying lazy on his sofa or her sofa. 60 to 70 percent of its wage spends only after two days. That's a good one. 30 percent of all utensils are thrown away after every meal. So we eat and we throw away. 46 percent of food throws away because she or he doesn't like it. Right? There's a big thing about taste and what we like in this economy. And 31 percent of food is spoiled because there is no space in the fridge because it just over overstacks things. Well, welcome to today's human being. This is what we are. 92% of the time our cars stand parked. Do we really need so many cars then? If 92% of the time they are parked, they're not used. 60% of uh, office space is not used at all. So we're just building buildings that are empty. 60 to 70% of plastic bottles are gone after only one recycling. 30% of steel, which is pretty much the most, almost plastic and steel or plastic and iron, two most ubiquitous materials that are all around us. And 30% of this we lose after only first usage. So we don't recycle it at all. 46% of vegetables are thrown away because they're not bread pit of all veggies, right? So what we do have is these kind of, these. Um, uh, scanning scanning processes where vegetables are not put in supermarkets if they're not good enough, if they're not visually good enough. So they can be perfect, but they're not visually good. So they're thrown away. Is it really something that we want to live with? 31% of food we throw because we, we storage it too long and it just spoils. So the logistics are not optimized. It's a lot of trash that we produce and right, and some of this is never seen by our eyes because it's somewhere behind the scenes. And I'm going to talk about the things that we with that, that are currently being done uh, in order to prevent this. And to give a little bit of uh, narrative and context, so this is how the uh, story goes in Serbia. These are the, the materials that can be recycled, and they can be returned back to use. And the uh, uh, the relation between export and import of these materials. So th three things are very um, are poking my eyes currently. It's paper and carton. It is plastics, and it is uh, wood waste. So uh, why do we have to import? pretty much the same amounts, not pretty much the same amounts, but a large portion of the amounts, if we can, if we can produce this. 
And why do we have to do this for part, cart, uh, paper and carton? And why do we have to do this with plastics? There are, so that means maybe currently there are obstacles and there are not capacities and the, the different market uh, trends and also pricing. But I will tell you one thing. One is there is a huge opportunity there. And the second is the, uh, a lot of floats are not visible currently on the market. So people do not know who to call if they want to buy uh, recycled paper from the local resources. Uh, and this needs to change. And this is pretty much through not the same graphic, but pretty much similar situation in, in countries around. And also not for the old materials, but this is generally the problem. One of the points of circular economy beacons is to try to pinpoint what are the connections in order at least to close the loop within the region to make these uh, materials more visible. Right, so some of the things are, uh, that are not good is legal legislature. And we did, did have uh, problems with this because we didn't have a defined end of waste status. We didn't have byproducts with status. We couldn't relook materials back to production if you, we wanted to do this legally. And uh, these, are, these laws and uh, policies are becoming better and better in Serbia at least. So we are slowly enabling real circular economy. And therefore, we're not going to talk about waste management anymore. We're going to talk about uh, the retention of value of materials. And this is how materials are going to go back in the economy, the production and the consumption of waste. EPR for medical and pharmaceutical products are, were better. And there are a couple of more things that uh, we have better in, in our uh, legislative parts. The policy part is, uh, okay, so, so there are two, two issues with this. Uh, we do have on paper legisl uh, legal laws, et cetera, and, and bylaws, but they're not implemented. Why? Because it's too expensive to control the whole system. There are a lot of freelancers. Oh, sorry, freelancers. Well, freelancers are good, but free riders are not. There are a lot of free riders. Why do we have a lot of free riders? Well, yeah, as I said, it's very expensive to control the whole system. So if we want to remedy the, the, the problems, this is the conclusion. If we want to remedy problems, it is much more expensive than if we design not to have problems. In other ways, there is an old saying, um, in Serbia, it's better to prevent than to cure. And this stands true for many of the economic as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. 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 Uh, the landfill that we have contaminated throughout the ages of, of putting waste there. So these are end of pipe solutions. Mid of the pipe solutions are, for instance, if we produce and we want to put some filters on the fab factories or, or create some recycling systems in the, uh, in the, in the factory. So it, uh, uh, it prevents polluting other, but within the process. And there are beginning of the site solutions, which are designed for circular economy. And these are the best one and the least expensive ones if we design the whole project in order to get to circular economy. If we don't get this parallel, we're always gonna ask wrong questions, which are, it's too expensive to, you know, to, to remedy the waste management. Yes, it is because we were not thinking from the beginning how it can be designed in order not to produce waste. And this is the whole notion of the current uh, way of looking at circular economy try to design the product, not for, to produce waste at all. Um, there is a lovely um, model of circular economy that I'd like to use. It is uh, created by Accenture Strategy. Um, and it talks about the business models throughout the life cycle. And the life cycle is a very important word in circular economy. There are different tactics that are here arranged with, uh, uh, just a second. Yeah, with uh, with these uh, thin arrows, and what we are going to talk about is today is okay. Right. Are these two flows? If we're creating uh, returning byproducts, not only from manufacturing, sorry, that's a that's a wrong thing, but also from the end of use, how take how can they be used for the for the manufacturing process? 
and how they can be procured. Right, so there will be a couple of examples of good practice. Some of them come from Serbia. One thing that was recently uh, reorganized, production was reorganized, thankfully to uh, United Nations Development Program and their dedication to circular economy was a company that produces essential oils in Serbia. The name is Anikola. And what they realized is that they can use a lot of their waste to actually close the circle and make their um, plantations or cultivation much better. So how does that work? They cultivate uh, herbs to, in order to produce essential oils, which is on the far left side. They of course source some, some of the materials to, to create these essential oils and it's a beautiful thing. But then there are some, uh, there are some wastes from cultivation, bio waste, but also from the production. Uh, bio waste is then generated to create it into pellets. Pellets are used to generate energy you know, for the production. Sorry, maybe that one never misses here. For the production, the energy of the pellets, burned pellets are uh, producing uh, an excess of material, which is in the form of pellet ash or ash, which is then re reintroduced into the fertilizers complete complete uh, amount of pellet is uh, introduced in fertilizers and then come back to cultivation. There are some ways that they also some ways that they need to take care of. They're working on this. But this is one of the examples how a logic works together with the biz with business and uh, how you can reduce your uh, your bills with energy for instance because you produce your own energy source and how can you reduce the uh, um, the impact, but also the cost of fertilizers, because you are fertilizing your own ground from the process that you have created. The second one, uh, also coming from Serbia, is FEPLO. They have uh, realized that there is, yeah, they have experimented. There is a, a, a nice video on YouTube, especially for Serbian speaking um, counterparts, about uh, explaining their technology. And they are still moving into uh, perfecting everything that they do, but uh, but at least the idea is good. So what they have realized, there is a lot of uh, uh, a very good material, which is underused or actually currently completely misused. This is that part. And they have uh, worked on the technology, how to create uh, a very strong, durable um, construction panels. So they came from the position of economics, not for uh, hugging the trees. So they have realized that Tetra Pak is really uh, a good, a good, um, a good material that is uh, that is uh, water resistant, uh, and that can exchange um, some other materials. Uh, yeah, you can go inside. I don't want to name them. <laughs> some other materials uh, with their characteristics. So what they do is they collect fifty percent, pretty much fifty percent of used Tetra Pak from the market. The tetra pack is from the factory being disposed, uh, sorry, distributed on the market and then used, went to communal waste. This is a great conundrum how to weigh, how to regulate the communal waste. But they find their ways to extract um, tetra pack, which is used from communal waste, bring it to, the, to their factory and mix it with the excess of materials of, from directly from tetra pack excess materials, right? And these two streams are creating within their process and within their technology are creating eco construction panels. Why are they eco? They don't use adhesives, they use uh, waste materials. And, um, and yeah, and, the, 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 and at the end of the process, there is zero waste because it's an easy thing to do. Every time at the end of the process, they need to cut all the panels. And of course, there are some remaining parts. They just put it back at the beginning of the process, shred it again press it again, and basically there is a zero waste production from their, from their side. The last one, or not the last one, but almost the last one, is a little bit more complicated. And it is about Queensland, uh, Australia. How do they manage to create a bit of more complex uh, scheme for creating a road construction, sorry. So they used construction and demolition ways. They used they used tires, they used fly ash, and they use a couple of methodologies that are mobilization that to repairing the asphalt and also asphalt recycling points. 
and they've created a lot of uh, uh, savings from 30% uh, to, to asphalt that is being recycled now up to 80% of energy uh, savings due to using fly ash from other, from other uh, country, uh, companies, oh, sorry, factories. Um, and in this way, they're, they're literally closing the loop and using the waste of other industries in order to better, not only to use, but to better their asphalt. It is well known within the road construction engineers that tires are actually giving flexibility and durability to asphalt. So they use this uh, excess of, sorry, waste materials for their own good. And not only using this, but they're producing a longer life of asphalts. And that's why they go on site and do in situ stabilization as well as rubbilization in order to prolong the life cycle of the same asphalt or sorry, of the same uh, foods. But now we were talking about how to produce waste from the, from the end of life phase, which is when it becomes waste, then we produce some value. But the very crucial thing is how to produce um, circular um, value or circular products, thinking from the design phase, as mentioned before. Why? This is why. Because 80% of the impact of our products is determined in our decision-making process in the stage of design. And this is what we need to think about. Not only to think about potential solutions that are ad hoc solutions, because we are creating waste. Yes, they're good, they're necessary, but we need to think about a different side of the story, a different side of the coin, which is designed for circularity. And soon enough in Serbia, we will see more and more um, opportunities to join programs and projects. And I, uh, yeah, for uh, that will have this particular uh, pinpoints of the design engraved in their projects, uh, projects or products. So we need to start and, and, and at least in Serbian soil, there will be projects that support design for prolonged life cycle, design for recyclability, design for disassembly and ease of repairs, design of energy and water efficiency, design for durability, design uh, toxic free design, design for upgradeability, modular design, zero waste production and clean and or clean production. So it's time to start thinking about these things because they will become parameters of, uh, of what we produce in the future. Not to, uh, just to be sure, I also want to mention the, the parts of this diagram is that we can see that the last green cycle is recycled and the first green cycle is sharing a optimized use. That's why circular design is very important in order to be ready for the market that will be used more uh, intensively and uh, with a longer lifespan, which means that, yeah, machines and products will not be produced uh, for only until the warranty uh, expires, but including different business models, they will be created <clears throat> uh, to withstand a much longer lifespan. So with that in mind, one of the participants of the uh, Academy for Circular Economy uh, had, uh, had, had well, actually came with the idea to the Academy and then started and developed his work uh, by a tremendous amount in the year or so and have designed an eco-friendly biodegradable product that exchanges um, styrofoam, which is one of the biggest plastic-based or, or fossil-based pollutants in the, in the world. So they have, uh, they have realized the process, they have created a process uh, through which fungi are growing through the garbage that we are uh, throwing away. And um, there and the specific set of fungi are actually uh, growing into the, into the molds and they can be folded. They can be of different characteristics depending how they're how they're grown. They can be soft. They can be hard. They can be uh, durable. Uh, they can be very much acoustic uh, or or fire. Just let me see if we have it here. Um, 
yeah, they can be fire resistance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is when we start thinking about cradle to cradle, or actually, how do we design a product so it can be returned back to nature uh, or returned back to usage? And with this kind of production, they have thought about every step of their life cycle and ensure that they that their uh, product is actually viable both for production again production or for um, easy dissolvement into the nature so it doesn't pollute the last two questions that i will end is um, the design is very important and there are two things to be explored additionally here in serbia i definitely know that we do have a lot of things to deal with in uh, two core topics uh, that are called urban mining and landfill mining. And we have to start thinking about, are they feasible? Are they good for our society? And what can be mined? In general, we have transferred the mines, the old fashioned mines, where we mine for gold, sorry, for ores, to cities and landfills, to the um, anthropo created uh, mines that are currently in urban areas from the underused uh, buildings and infrastructure up to landfills where we just disposed of, dispose of many valuable materials, not only because of the mining of materials, but also for the de depollution of our environment. Right, so there are a couple of more examples I will share definitely uh, this, um, this uh, presentation with you. And sincere thanks for the time invested in this. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, Adriana, up to you. Uh, it's back to you because I forgot to ask the question. And I, the question was also in the poll. Now it, will, it would ruin everything because I already said the information. But, uh, but nevertheless, if you want to know more about the project, you can visit this site or contact us or subscribe to the newsletter. And also, if you want to talk more about Circle Economy Serbia, feel free to drop us a mail. We're always available to coffee and circular, circular coffee. Thank you very much. Thank you, Milan, for um, your examples uh, that you shared with us on um, how companies can implement circular economy principles and uh, promote the uh, retention of value of materials and uh, reduce costs and environment, environmental impact. That is the most important thing, to reduce the environmental impact. Um, I, uh, we do have one more question. Uh, it's uh, regarding the Academy for Circular Economy. How uh, can uh, this academy help companies with uh, design for circularity? Can you be more... Uh, yeah, well, that's a good question. So what we do in the academy is we systemically educate managers and decision makers, that's our uh, target group, about how to create a system that supports circular economy, how to create a set of skills in order to have employees that are ready to carry on this, this story about circular economy. And one of the modules, there are four modules currently in the design, one of the modules is specifically dedicated to circular and eco design. So people will, um, people uh, or participants will get to know everything they need to know um, about circular and eco design in the in one of the modules. But it cannot be disassembled and taught only the eco design model. Model. So this is, this would be a mistake if uh, if uh, participants don't know. Uh, prologue, prior stories to why this is important and how to implement this and what to take care of after this is being designed. Uh, that's why like uh, the, the warm recommendation is to dedicate some time to the whole program of Circular Economy. Thank you, Milana Nath. Uh, before we close, uh, we do want to ask our uh, participants to give us uh, their feedback. We have uh, three short questions. I will launch uh, the polls for these uh, questions. Just a second. Just a second. No, 
Yes, I just launched the first uh, feedback poll. We are glad uh, to see that uh, you did like our event. Now I will uh, launch uh, the second one. We're going to get spoiled if everything is fine. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, uh, looks like you did like the agenda as well. 90% of uh, our audience like the agenda. Okay, and the last poll. Maybe we could some, put some groovy music while people are polling. It will give us even higher grades. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you think so. <laughs> yes, it's a good idea, Milan. <laughs> Okay. Yes, the speakers uh, also are uh, okay, and 83% uh, of uh, your responses are in uh, favor of uh, our speakers, and you rate them as excellent. Thank you very much. And Milan, I will, I will like, will uh, let you to close uh, this meeting because I did mention you are the driving force of this project. Thanks. Uh, well, I'm the craziest one, but the driving force is actually all the other partners that are that are doing separate things on, on, on creating the systemic uh, endeavor into circular economy. The last words will be really just let's connect, uh, ask us questions, what is necessary. We really need uh, your inputs on what do you need in order to make this circular economy work what skills, what knowledges, what methodologies, what parts of professional, um, I don't know, production or, or, or education, or, um, or what kind of uh, networking do you need uh, in order to facilitate a further project and further design of Beacons? Because this is not a project that will end this year. We aim it to uh, become a, a main fertile ground for the regional co-design of circular innovation in the forthcoming three, four, five, seven, seven years, depends on how how long will will we be needed. So it's the only encouragement is let's keep in touch, uh, write us emails or uh, subscribe to the things and give us your voices also with the ideas and innovation. This is what we would like to also, not only to promote, but take it to another level from the from idea to consumption, sorry, from idea to market. This is in later stages a bit of beacons, but it's good to start um, promoting or it's good to start um, uh, putting the ideas on the agenda so we know so we know what to map and, and, and where to uh, focus our, our resources on. And that will be it. I mean, that, that will be it for now. Uh, we do have in a month, we, we will organize a, a slightly bigger event. They will cover a little bit more topics on circular economy. You will be definitely informed about this. So leave us. Um, I think that people have left right emails in the application part. So we do have an, uh, your emails and you will get informed about all the future activities that we're working on. Currently, we're uh, including circular economy to two companies in in Serbia and two companies in Romania. And this whole process will last until mid-year next year. And then we'll open calls for new companies that would like to include circular economy in their uh, in their functioning, in their work. Uh, and it's highly recommended to follow our, our uh, announcements in order not to miss the opportunity of implementation of this, of this model into your uh, business. And we will spread this activities to Bulgaria. Um, yeah, to Bulgaria for next year. So that's from my side. Thank you very much for participating and sharing with us your expertise, time and knowledge. Until the, the next time, I wish you a very good and a successful day. 
Thank you very much. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.